Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jamie Costa, and my preferred pronouns are she and her. And I am the Gallery Experience Associate at the Los Angeles Museum Art Gallery. And on behalf of the gallery, we're excited to present today's program, Archives and Relating Today, in conjunction with our current online-only exhibition, Archive Machines. Today's program was developed in response to the ongoing quarantine and the quote unquote archive, which in a lot of different ways has been reconsidered in relation to online media and the way in which people's histories are told. In this conversation, directors of some of Los Angeles based institutions will share the incredible archive based work their organizations do and how they've continued to serve their communities in both physical and digital spaces. Before I introduce our moderator, I do have a few housekeeping bits. Uh, the first being, please make sure your microphone is muted during the speakers presentations and we will have a few minutes toward the end of the program for a Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat box. And as a reminder, the program is being recorded, so uh, it can be made available on the MAG's website at a later date and be distributed to the folks who are unable to join us for today's live program. And finally, if you feel comfortable, please include your preferred pronouns in your screen name or in the chat. And with that, I'm honored to introduce our moderator for today's program, Umi Su, and I'll read out their bio before I turn it over to them. Umi Su is a public humanist and strategic designer with research and organizing agendas for equity in arts, technology, and civic life. They are currently the director of content strategy at One Archives Foundation. Previously, Sue led digital and data initiatives at the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs. They teach as adjunct faculty at Art Center College of Design and USC Marshall School of Business and have published extensively on digital media, data, and internet culture. As a sound ethnographer and artist, Sue has received fellowships and awards from the National Endowment for the Arts, American Council for Learned Society, Shuttleworth Foundation, and LA Metro, and has works presented by the Rubin Museum, Japanese American National Museum, and CTM Festival in Berlin. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Umi. Thank you, Jamie. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm delighted to be here adjacent to the brilliant and the fierce minds folks who have been preserving people's history and building community archives for a long time. Um, archiving is a labor of love with so much thoughtfulness that goes along every step of the process. And uh, I am very excited to hear from our panelists today to see how they each do their work and uh, along the process of doing their work, the kind of thoughtful questions that they ask, um, and then how they answer them for, um, not only for the practices that they do at institutions that they work for and lead, but also for the larger community that they serve. Um, so I was told that I have a few jobs to do. I'm gonna introduce all the panelists, so I'll do that. And um, I will moderate a discussion among the panelists. And at the very end, I will be taking questions from all of y'all in the audience. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll be watching time too. So it's many jobs and uh, be multitasking a little bit. So thank you all for coming. Without further ado, I will introduce all of our panelists. I'm gonna start with Haley. Haley Lohman is a multidisciplinary artist working in sculpture, installation, and performance. Haley is the co-founder and director of Los Angeles Contemporary Archive, LACA, an artist-run archive and a non-circulating library in which contemporary creative processes are recorded and preserved. She also founded Autonomous Oral History Group, 
AOHG, a cooperative that examines the ethics that operate in leadership role. I'm a huge fan of LACA. And by the way, LACA has a really amazing Instagram account that I follow daily. Um, I'm very excited to hear from Haley today. Next, we will have John Malpede. John Malpede is a director, performer, writer, and the founder of the theater ensemble, Los Angeles Poverty Department. The company's mission is to create the performances that connect lived experiences to social forces that shape the lives of poor people. Malpede has produced community-engaged projects throughout the US and in the UK, in the Netherlands, France, and Belgium. He has received a New York Dance and Performance Bessie Award, San Francisco Art Institute Kent Award, the LA Stage Alliance Ovation Award, and various fellowships from the NEA, California Arts Council, and more. I've been following the incredible work of the LA Poverty Department as I moved here nine years ago. Welcome, John. Okay, next is Ami, Amitas Motivali is an artist born in Iran. She explores the culture and survival of people living in poverty, conflict, and or war. Her experience as a transnational migrant is foundational in her work. Amitas is also the director of William Grant Still Art Center, a multi-arts exhibition and educational space focusing on community histories and broadening canons through the arts. Motivali is invested in research, collaboration, and potential of art to expand thought. In the fall of 2014, she was the visionary and oversaw a citywide initiative called LA Islam Arts Initiative, which brought together multiple institutions with local organizations, as well as artists, curators, and thinkers to question art historical definitions of Islamic art and regions. I had the honor of helping Ami with this initiative with digital and content strategy when I was working at DCA. And I am so excited about reconnecting with Ami today. Finally, we have Carol A. Wells. Carol Wells earned her bachelor's in history and master's in art history at UCLA. She taught the history of art and architecture for 13 years at California State University in Fullerton. Wells has published numerous articles and catalog essays on political poster art and has produced over 100 political posters exhibitions since 1981. Wells is the founder and ex executive director of Center for the Study of Political Graphics, which is an incredible treasure trove of political and graphic design history. I'm thrilled to hear Carol talk about her long-term engagement with archives today. Welcome, everyone. So archiving and collecting comes in different shades and practices. And for this first question I have for you, it's more or less a promise, it's less of a question. I just, I'm curious just how you define archive in your work Tell us a bit about how archiving and collecting fits into your work and in the wonderful organizations that you lead. And I know that many of you are activists and artists and curators, in addition to being collectors and archivists. So we also love to hear kind of how you think about the relationships between these different things that you do. And uh, so it looks like among our panelists, Haley has been unmuted. Would you be willing to go first? Yeah. Um, okay, great. Thank you so much, um, Jamie and Lamag and Yumi and everyone that's joining us today. Um, I'm Haley Lohman. I'm the co-founder and director of Los Angeles Contemporary Archive. Uh, LACA is an art archive and library that collects underexposed artistic modes of expression happening in our current moment. So what we collect is, oh, thank you. What we collect is ephemera associated with artistic production. For example, remnants of performances or events, reci receipts, <laughs> recipes, um, also, uh, studio leases, documentation, transcripts. LACA houses around 5,000 physical artist publications, 
and many of those are limited editions or unique prints. Um, so how we started was LACA grew out of frustration with how little object donors typically contribute to their own metadata or the descriptions of their materials. LACA archivists work closely with artists to input their descriptive metadata into the database, allowing them to contextualize their material and knowledge in their own terms. So as a repository of knowledge then, LACA is a platform to debate how information is valued. We work on making the collection and our programming inclusive of things such as storytelling, the ghostly and psychic, the spiritual and the silenced. It's a space to acknowledge lived experiences, becoming memory, and maintain an equal value towards what is absent in the stacks. So thank you so much. I think John is next. Uh, hi, folks. So, um, Los Angeles Poverty Department, as, as Umi mentioned, is a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, started as a performance group uh, for people living in Skid Row, Los Angeles. And um, so, I don't know if you can scroll down on this. On this, is that possible? Yeah. So, um, uh, Skid Row is a, you know Skid Row is a sandwich between the, the arts district and the rest of downtown. Um, in the 70s, you know, it, it's been under development pressure and, and desire to get rid of it for and, you know, make a bazillion dollars instead. Uh, since the 70s, when, when activists uh, managed to save the, the housing in uh, between Main Street and Alameda 7th and 3rd, that became Skid Row uh, and a neighborhood that only people living in low income housing or shelters or on the street, as we all know, um, could live there. And as a result, they, the organizing continued and the community got stronger and stronger and stronger while it's continued to be under threat of displacement. Um, this project, this is a special archive called Walk the Talk. Among, we, have many, we have a lot of our projects are really research intensive. Like right now we're working with other uh, activist groups in Skid Row around in dialogue with the, the city about the new development plan that's coming down the pike. But uh, Walk the Talk is a project that started out, it was gonna be like a Hollywood Walk of Fame that acknowledged the activist history in um, Skid Row. And of course, like all good public art projects, it ran into a lot of opposition, specifically from Jan Perry, who was then the council person and the, the business district who didn't wanna see that happen. So um, we had always intended it to have a parade element and uh, if you see here, we now have, a, we interview, there's a community nominating process. People who have done important things in Skid Row are nominated by the community, then interviewed at length, like two hours. And then um, we make a parade. This year we couldn't make a parade, where we make little uh, performances and have a brass band, little performances that tell the stories uh, in their words from their uh, interviews. We couldn't do a parade this year. Uh, we, we instead launched this website that, that uh, made all of the, the website, the, the software had already been specially designed um, by Rob Oxhorn. It was at, available at our Skid Row History Museum and Archive. Now it's available online and this is the site where you can click on any one of these people on the left and, um, and yeah, click on, no, down like, yeah, okay. A and Angelia Harper, Coach Ron, anybody? Yeah. And then you'll see the portrait of Coach Ron. Um, there's also, um, you can have the, the interview of Coach Ron. If you scroll back up, you can click on the interview of Coach Ron. The bio, the interview, uh, which you can, you can follow it and click on any part in the interview and it'll go there. And then you can see the performance we did about Coach Ron on the street. In this case, in this case because it was 2020, we did it on Zoom actually the prior years. We do it every two years because it takes about seven, seven or eight months to make it between the nominating process and the parade. Um, so the, the, all of our archiving efforts at the Skid Row History Museum and Archive, which is the space we inhabit when we can, um, it's all about 
you know, representing that this is a neighborhood and it's all about uh, ensuring its vitality and resisting its displacement. That's why we are coming. Thank you so much, John. Ami, are you next? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about the William Grant Still Arts Center um, and uh, maybe talk to you about the annual Black Doll Show, but also talk to you about a lot of the archives that we have gathered. Uh, we collect to a certain extent, but mostly we gather. Uh, William Grant Still Arts Center was opened in 1977, and um, the person behind it actually was Maxine Waters, where um, she really felt like the community needed an art center that could be of uh, multi-arts use, and named after, uh, you know, the composer, Dr. William Grant Still, who was living in the neighborhood. So we've been around for that long, for 43 years. For 40 years now, we're coming upon the 40th annual Black Doll Show, um, we have hosted the annual Black Doll Show, and um, that's the longest running exhibition actually in the city of Los Angeles. And I see the Black Doll Show as sort of the first form of archive that existed at the William Grant Still Art Center. I mean, there were many others, but, um, but really the most significant because it was really archiving um, history, it was uh, archiving psychology, it was ar archiving pedagogy, and um, and art all through visual arts. So um, we continue that tradition. Uh, you can just scroll through the images. I'm, I'm not gonna talk about one particular thing. Um, with our exhibitions, we also put on programs and it's really about an archive that goes beyond what you um, can tactily handle. We want the archive to be things that we can um, uh, pedagogically disseminate um, either orally or orally or visually. Uh, we host workshops that teach uh, doll making and um, keep the tradition alive. We do quilting, we do archiving. We've had numerous archiving workshops and um, it's really a, a community that um, already comes with so many collectors. So it was really just um, like, it was the easiest thing to do. Uh, when I started working at the William Grant Still Art Center 16 years ago, I met um, a gentleman by the name of C. Jerome Woods, who was a, sp a special ed teacher. And uh, C. Jerome Woods came to me one day with uh, boxes of um, shoe boxes. And in it, I opened up, and I was one of the first people that got to open up these shoe boxes. And in it, I saw an immense treasure of uh, photographs, ephemera, archives from um, at the beach, some of um, the most amazing and oldest photographs of uh, Sir Lady Java and um, the history of Jules Catch One. So he had been collecting all of this while he was a teacher and a dancer. And um, we've met other people throughout our time and decided that um, because we have so many amazing collectors in the neighborhood that some people call, um, what is it, uh, hoarders? Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with some of the terminology, the derogatory terminology around it, because for me, it's all gems. Um, and uh, we brought people together and started to this right here, uh, West Adams Collectors Club. We started to actually host some workshops where we um, were teaching folks that were keeping their histories. And in West Adams and South Central LA, um, a lot of people were keeping their own histories because histories of people of color, in particular poor people of color, was not being canonized, was not being documented. And so people had to take it upon themselves. People had to do clippings and, um, and, and pick up things and hold on to them because they knew that it was going to be important. And um, we brought folks together. We uh, taught um, people through uh, other librarians and archivists from our community. Um, Delena Hunter is now um, doing a lot of work at UCLA, but she led some of our uh, workshops and she's in that photo photograph. Um, and we basically worked to uh, catalog, preserve, talk about digitization. We do work with digitization and we are starting a program where we're going to start um, uh, a partnership with a local institution to 
um, help people digitize all of their works and preserve them that way, knowing that digitization isn't the be all and end all. And um, basically continuing, our, our, our mission is not only to acknowledge, exhibit, and work with the archives of our community, but also to make sure that next generations continue preserving their histories because we haven't sh seen a huge revolution in the world where um, the people who are marginalized are being canonized. And until that happens, it's still necessary for us to maintain this. Thanks so much, Ami. And finally, we have Carol. Carol Wells, are you ready? Carol, you're muted. I do that all the time, so I apologize. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, and um, the, the Center for the Study of Political Graphics is um, 31 years old, and we have, at the moment, ni over 90,000 human rights and protest posters from all over the world. It is um, about 40% of the collection is international, so six, about a 60-40 split between U.S. and international. The, um, the, the bulk of the archive, the bulk of the collection is 1960s to the present, but we do have things going back to the 19th century. But of the post-World War II collection, we actually are the largest collection in the United States of post-World War II graphic materials. And I think there's, I mean, we're among the top three political, the three largest uh, political poster archives in the world. So, and the other two uh, are, have been, were founded by inst major institutions or governments, and they were started in the 20s or 30s, and we're almost as large as they are. And we were we started with nothing, no budget, no institution, and um, collecting things that were not exactly popular with governments, any governments, and uh, and that was just 31 years ago. So it's amazing how quickly we've grown, and we've grown that quickly. And, and it was interesting when Ami said that they are um, mainly a gatherer, but they do some collection. I'd never made that distinction till I heard Amy. Uh, Ami talk about that. And we, it started with my personal collection, which actually started out of my political organizing. So when I was in Nicaragua in 1981, um, I actually collected my first poster and became, my life changed in with that Nicaragua trip and a poster literally changed my life. So I have very personal experience of the power of graphics and the power of images and the power of, of uh, the ability of a poster to change someone's life. But we have, we have two um, primary uh, programs. One is our exhibition program. We've done uh, many dozens of, uh, I mean, of exhibitions. Some are just one for one time only. One, some, most of them are tended to travel. And then our other project is our digitization, our access uh, project. So for the, 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 very, the literally the, the center started, I started it as a resource for activists, as a, as a way of getting material to use for didactic purposes. When we did demonstrations, the same people would come and people would honk or when they drove by, but they didn't really necessarily, they learned that there was a support group, that they learned there was a group of people that opposed what the government was doing uh, or supported what the government was doing in some cases, not not this not that I can think of, but um, but for the most part, you were really reaching the converted, and but an exhibition would would which would be in a library or a school or a community center, would give people a chance at their own speed, at their own level, at their own comfort level, uh, the ability to, to to learn about what this is all about, and it was also interesting that we could get you know. 20 people to help organize an exhibition and I'm, I'm sorry 20 people to organize a protest demonstration but the movement the activists who were very committed very very intense um, didn't understand the importance of art they had they had a very art for art's sake bourgeois definition of art as decoration art as entertainment art as background to keep people interested when you're changing speakers but they didn't understand that art was central to the revolution and to social change. And the people in 
um, in Central America, the people in Africa, the activists, they understood it. But because of the dominance in many ways of, of, of Hollywood, of the media, and of course of the US government um, during the 50s and the blacklisting and the literally wiping out of a progressive generation of political artists, we really kind of fell back into the definition of art that was available to us as opposed to art as an activist, uh, essential to activism, is really central to social change. So we, we you know, basically it was my husband and I that kind of put these first exhibitions on because the rest of the movement that was happy to organize the protests didn't see the point of doing an exhibition and, and a whole entire new audience would be reached with these exhibitions. So it was really, it was something that I, the more I did it, the more I realized the importance of continuing to do it. We, um, we, so I started with my own collection of, you know, 3,500, 5,000 posters that I collected um, when I would, you know, give lectures and I would go all over the country and every place had a left bookstore and all these left bookstores had all these leftover posters from events that didn't get distributed. So that was really the, the origin of the initial, of the initial collection. And once we were known, once we started getting known, people started giving us their collections. But every time we do it, and we, we've gotten tens of thousands from other people, and we're still getting them. So anybody out there who has posters or goes to protests, um, and you don't know what to do with them, or even if you do know what to do with them, think about giving them to us, because that's really how we continue to collect and continue to grow, and to continue to have a very diverse archive. Um, the majority of the archive is um, dealing with marginalized communities, struggles that don't make the, you know, the, the corporate press that aren't dealt with. And uh, we, we, our exhibition programs have a, um, every exhibition has a community curatorial committee that is made up of members of the community that produce the posters and or that the communities that the posters are about. So there is no, no exhibition that we do is done separate from the communities that they are referencing. And so every exhibition has their own unique I call them community curatorial committees, but we, we, once, we, once we decide what exhibition we're gonna do, well, then we put together the committee for everyone. Um, sometimes we come up with our own exhibition themes, sometimes people from, from the outside communities, communities outside the center will say, will you do an exhibition on this? And so it, the, the, the themes come from both within the organization and from uh, outside the organization. So that's another way that the diversity is, um, is maintained in the organization. And every time we do a new exhibition, we start with the, the posters that are in the collection, then the curatorial committee will say, okay, you're missing this, this, and this. And so then they become part of the outreach to gather posters to really fill out what we're missing. Uh, and I know we'll talk more about the digitization, but at this point, um, I think I've probably gone over my time, but uh, we, we are, we're really pushing the digitization right now, a lot of that because of COVID-19, but we'll, um, we were actually doing that before and we can talk more about that later. And just one last thing, we are fighting eviction right now. There is a, uh, a, a, um, a, a petition on our website, politicalgraphics.org, to, uh, it's not just the Center for the Study of Political Graphics, but about a dozen uh, peace and justice groups that uh, have been functioning in Los Angeles for many years. And so please sign the petition opposing the eviction of all of the peace and justice groups in the Peace Center. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, it's so interesting to hear from all of you. And, you know, for each project, there is there's a unique relationship to the politics of archiving. And, uh, and I'm just curious, like, I think in general, we know that to archive something, to preserve it, collect it, is to ascribe value to it, right? So how do you deal with the politics of archiving, the privilege that, you know, either becomes an outcome of it or, you know, have to deal with the institutional kind of dynamics of that? And also, how do you deal with like the relationship to the community whose experience is archived in your work? Haley, are you interested yeah, in taking? Yeah. Great. I'll go first. Um, I'm happy that Carol's talking about uh, her eviction. That's um, that's uh, emergent stuff that's happening right now. 
Um, so how do I deal with the politics of the archive? And I think that this has been by having a clear grasp of my role. Um, so I'm an artist as well as an archivist and oral historian. And I make a clear distinction between the organizational aspect, which I identify as my artwork, and then the custodianship and the contents inside of LACA that I deem as other people's art. Um, where I'm strictly caretaker and archivist. So while these roles may seem blurry, I've created very strong boundaries when my art stops and someone else's begins. Um, I create organizations as an artist because I have noted down, um, I think it's a fruitful role to think up more equitable and functional institutional systems. And I also investigate the problematics of legitimizing so-called official accounts of history, and then the ways in which we preserve our thoughts, objects, and bodies. Well, um, I would like to speak on this. Uh, at the William Grant Still, a lot of the archives that we present are items that are that have historically not been presented by um, major institutions. They're housed in the community. One thing that's very important to us is that we present to our community the, community, the original archives. So we get the actual items and present it. And um, a lot of people really are frightened by that. They're like, oh, but what about the liability? What if something happens to it? I mean, when it comes to theft and such or damage um, by human uh, hands, it, it doesn't happen. The people in our community really value and care for um, everything that we have up on the walls or hanging or in whatever way that we present it. So it's really incredible in that sense. And also, it's really about bringing the community voices and their particular histories in. So when it comes to privilege, yeah, there is a privilege because we are privileging those who have had the ability to collect these. That means that they've had um, access to um, housing um, and they've had um, some, some sort of position in their life where they have been able to collect these items. Um, we are trying to expand out and work with communities beyond that because um, for a very long time we've also had a large community of houseless individuals. We have a community of um, sex workers and we want to document and canonize all of that and in particular the cultural aspects of, of all of those histories. Yeah, it's interesting that I mean talk about the human damage is, is, doesn't exist with the collections, the archives that she has. Um, they very much happen with the archives that we have. And they're destroyed as much by the people who love them, who, you know, who, who don't, but do not see their historical importance or their artistic importance, and they will throw them in the trash after a demonstration. Uh, or the artists who make them, but they, they, these, these are not art. These are their posters for the movement, and they don't even keep their own copies and have to come to us to, to borrow them back, uh, which is also happens a lot, surprisingly a lot. But the, 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 the primary damage is by the people who hate them, and a poster is intended to push people's buttons. A poster is intended, to, but posters take very strong positions. The majority of posters are against the, the, the government, Otherwise, the government doesn't need posters anymore. They use them till, till television came on. That was the primary way of getting ideas that the government had. Think of Uncle Sam Wants You. Think of all those recruiting posters that were US government produced. But since TV, they, 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 they've, got, you know, they've, got, they've got the White House. They've got the you know, New York Times. They've got the, you know, the major, major uh, networks. So they don't need posters. Much more cost effective to get this stuff on TV. But you know, just look at it, you know, the Robbie Canal used to have all these posters on the streets and how many of them just, you know, people, either people try to take them off to collect them for, for their own use, either financial or, as, you know, po political, or they were destroyed. They were just, you know, some, they really made people angry and they try to destroy them. We had, you'd think it'd be safe to have something in a library. We had um, some Black Panther Party posters in a library up in Sac Sacramento State 
and the librarian called me up. She says, I'm really sorry, but so fast we didn't, we couldn't stop it. We just thought it was a woman with a, a, a keys and that, cause we, we can't afford putting glass over them. So we put, with well, a shrink wrap, so they're, they're protected from, you know, fingerprints or, or food, but not if somebody really wants to destroy them, they can't. And so there was a, a, an Eldridge Cleaver for a president poster in the, the uh, Peace and Freedom Party, 1968, everybody's talking about 1968 now. And she'd taken her keys and she'd stabbed, you know, that, 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 that Eldridge Cleaver poster. I don't know why. I mean, I can think of lots of reasons, but I don't know why her, what her reason was. And um, we were actually were able to salvage the poster, because, you know, if, there were no holes in it. But even if there had been holes in it, we would have used it anyway. And that would have been, that would have been another story. That would have been another layer of the story to tell about, about this poster. Um, and so, so we, have to, we, we have to be, initially when I started doing exhibitions back in 81, we had no security requirements at all. We never said, don't put them by a window, don't put them by a door, don't, you know. And then as people started taking them because they loved them or they hated them, then we had to say, you know what, have somebody in the room, you know, no, they don't need a gun. In fact, I don't want them to have a gun, but there needs to be a body, somebody in the room that can at least deter people from, um, from defacing them or taking them. Uh. Can I say something for me? Okay. So um, I think I, well, I mentioned with Walk the Talk, for example, that that um, that particular archive is a, is a there's a community nominating process that starts at our festival for all skin Row artists in October, and anybody in the community uh, can nominate someone who they want to have acknowledged in Walk the Talk, and then there's a, a process that goes forward with that. So those are how, that's how those. Um, the community is involved in that. We also, you know, we do, we, a lot of our activities are sort of circular in a certain way. Like we do, we do exhibitions. So we did an exhibition called um, Zillionaires Against Humanity, which was how um, deviously the, uh, the initiative to create a Skid Row Neighborhood Council was defeated. And, and, uh, and so we worked with the Skid Row Formation Committee to, to present everything that, I mean, which, we had actually been involved in the whole thing, but anyway, to present all of their active, uh, their their documents of what had happened, and, and along with um, uh, uh, Adrian uh, Riskin, the Michael Kohlhaas blog, who who sort of did the backstory on how the thing was defeated, and created an exhibition of all that stuff, which then became uh, also part of the archive. Um, so, uh, and we did like another project. Um, we did a, we we had, we had read at one point that that the Daytona Beach Florida was very was a big recovery haven because there are all these rich uh, there are all these expensive recovery programs there and people stay in the community after they get get out of the programs and uh, we decided Skid Row was actually the biggest recovery community in in, in America because people uh, they have their free programs people get clean and sober they stay in the community because of the housing so we did a project called uh, biggest recovery community anywhere and we sort of uh you know interviewed a number of people in the in the neighborhood who were active in the recovery community and and that became also became a, a performance and part of the archive and then we then a lot of the activists in the neighborhood uh, over the years, they've given us collections like um, LA Cannes. Steve Diaz gave us LA Cannes collection around when they got the uh, the hotel uh, uh, conversion moratorium citywide. Um, and uh, Molly Lowry, who's passed away, uh, who started uh, Lamp, the first uh, day center for for uh, uh, dealing with mental health issues for for homeless men and women. Uh, when she, she gave us uh, part of her archive when she passed away. And uh, Alice Callahan, also a, a housing activist for, who started Skid Row Housing Trust in Las Familias del Pueblo, has also given us a bunch of stuff. So that's how we, uh, you know, the community is engaged. You know, I, I wanted to mention um, there was a uh, uh, in 2008, uh, there were sets of developers that were coming to West Adams that really wanted to um, start to um, take advantage of, of uh, people losing their homes. 
And so in 2010, we were slated to get shut by the Department of Cultural Affairs. Our community fought that. And um, the first exhibition I got to curate as director because I was actually laid off and then I was um, demanded by the community to be brought back as the director. And um, uh, first exhibition I curated, it was the 50th anniversary of SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So we got a lot of archives from SNCC and this was at the encouragement of a lot of community members. The name of our exhibition was Hell No, We Won't Go. And it made perfect sense because, you know, that was uh, Kwame Ture's uh, statement about going to Vietnam, but also made perfect sense for, for us. One of the walls was a collection from Imam, Imam Jamil Al-Amin, who is uh, also known as H.R.F. Brown. And the entire wall, almost the whole wall, was all stuff about pigs. So it was like police posters and almost every single one of them called police pigs or had imagery with pigs in it. And um, we had the most police visits and they would take pictures next to this wall actually. So I thought that was kind of fascinating and I thought I would share that as well. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, I think it's, like I feel like you, you've sort of touched on this already. Like so much of archiving work is, from what I what I'm hearing from you is is the sort of taking an activist stance, right? I mean, like wanting to do something with history, so then we can create some sort of change in the future, um, and that can mean various different things depending on the communities that you work with. But like just overall, like how do you foreground social justice in how you do your work as a, you know, in, in the archival work that you do. Like, can you say a bit more about that? Is it um, kind of working with community, community-led decision-making process? Um, what else do you think about when you're, you know, when you're executing your work with the idea of social justice, with the mission of social justice in mind? Yeah, I can talk on this. Um, so we built LACA to be a vehicle for artists to pursue their social justice aims. Um, and we're committed to facilitating this type of artistic production, research, and thought. But um, so there's very clear social justice um, projects that we take on um, these past couple months uh, alongside a group of artists. We are developing an abolitionist certificate program that can be implemented by art spaces. So this is everything from resource sharing to alternatives to calling the police for art spaces, um, generating self-analysis of sort of like day-to-day -day operations. And then I think that, I mean, looking back with the start of LACA, the, our first years, we were really trying to make ourselves um, a neutral acquirer of goods. Um, so I was operating in a mode of trying to remove my fingerprints um, or any curatorial choices from the archival process. And this, this I deemed was like good custodianship. Um, I mean, we tried to, we tried to accomplish this by asking artists to provide details, to input their data, to decide what should be saved and go into the collection. Um, but now I'm coming to the idea that biases are rather inevitable and should be made transparent um, and explored. So an example of this is what we're working on right now, which is this finding aid for Patricia Fernandez's project um which is like a 10-year capsule project called box a proposition for 10 years and what we've done is we've gathered oral accounts from the artists um we're taking young chung who's the receiver of the artworks oral account we have um the finding aid is ex we're experimenting with it and um we're adding in an archivist note an ethical reflection into it and I've been thinking about while working, while developing Fernandez's archive, kind of um, there's been repair work between women that's been, that's been going on. And this is actually, we're noting this in her archive. So I think by keeping track of my own internal mon monologue, I acknowledge 
uh, my state, like my particular state of being during the acquisition and, and how I'm feeling. So I think bias work can be pretty ugly sometimes, but I, I'm adamant that places like LACA um, shouldn't shy away from this kind of reflexive work or accountability work. Super interesting. Thank you so much. Um, would anybody else like to comment on this? Uh, Carol? Um, the, I mean, for the transparency of the Center for the Study of Political Graphics is like straight up front. I mean, the, the, it was founded as a resource for activists that were opposing U.S. intervention in Central America. So that's kind of, um, and in and, and, and creating a title, I try to create a, new, a neutral name that sounded more academic, that would give a more, you know, a, 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 more, a more neutral sounding academic, you know, center for the study of political graphics. But, uh, and that it was always so neutral, most people started thinking it was electoral posters, which is something that we, if people give them to the us, we'll collect them, but we don't go after them because they're usually very boring and it's not really, you know, elections do not social change bring about, although this, this, this current election, could definitely bring about serious social change. So we're, we're um, you know, although I don't think I've collected electoral posters from this one yet, maybe I better start. Um, but the, the, we actually maybe, you know, the vast majority of the collection is left of center um, for, for several reasons. One, the majority of protests in the world are against governments. The majority of governments are right, right to far right. Um, and, and since the majority of the posters we have are made in the U.S., and that's been the primary uh, uh, poster makers are obviously on the on the left, till re till recently, till very recently. Um, but the other part of that is that the our community that we're working with are the ones that are making these pro to protest posters. So our community, not only are the things we started collecting, but that the community that we work with primarily is also left of center. And so that this is reflecting our community uh, with all of its, you know, all of, all of its diversity. There's certainly no, the left is not monolithic in any way. Um, but people started getting us, giving us uh, right-wing posters. And they fit in our collection criteria. Our collection criteria is it must be overtly political. Everything is political. Every advertisement, every movie poster, everything is political, but they're not overtly political. So we only collect overtly political objects and objects that were made in multiples. We don't collect the handmade um, one of a kind posters, even if it has the same message. Part of the reason is practical, it's space. We have not a lot of space. But the bigger reason is because it was founded as a resource for activists, the multiple has an organizing aspect to it. Where if I have, you know, this is my poster, I made it, this is I hate war, that's my feeling. But if I make, you know, 15 copies of this by Xerox and I, give, and I find 15, 14 people that want to carry it with me or wherever they are, then that becomes an organizing action. And then we would take it. So we don't take one of a kind, but we will take something that was, you know, a small amount, 10 or 15. So, but a lot of the posters are made by organizations, by artists working with organizations, or artists that feel so strongly that they will put the resources in to producing them and then giving them to organizations. And then the organizations help with the distribution. So those, that's the limiting. But we have, um, I would say, if we have, 2% of the collection is right-wing. Some of them came from the FBI, that the FBI produced right-wing images. I mean, obviously, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's a being redundant. What images the FBI would produce would not be right-wing. But they claim to be left-wing images. That was kind of the irony. They claim to come from um, the Black Panther Party, and they weren't. They were, they were intended to sow dissent between the Black Panther Party and Ron Karenga's US group. So there was some very, very devious um, uh, uh, COINTELPRO activities using political graphics. But some are actually, you know, put out by the Tea Party or people who work with the Tea Party. Um, 
we have an issue right now. I, I, I will, the vast majority of the stuff we have is donated. We don't, we neither have the budget to buy stuff. Um, and so we, we're always getting posters donated, including most of the, of the right wing stuff is donated. Um, but there's a poster I just saw that's uh, supporting Amy Comey Barrett that it would be important for the archive to have. But it's, it's made by a, a, an anti-choice group. I will not give them money. You know, I will not, I will not. And, and, and I know they wouldn't donate. As soon as they look us up, they're going to see all our pro-choice stuff. So it's just real. It's an, it's, I mean, I may just take a picture of it and use that. But it's, um, it's, a, it's an interesting, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge of having the archive really represent, um, even if not equal representation, because, I, you know, w w this is clearly a, a left of center resource primarily, but that we have whatever we can get. And, and how to do that, um, you know, in this political climate, it's, 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 it's a constant challenge. Um, I would like to also um, discuss the fact that uh, I think one of the ways, I, years ago, I, I worked with a group of friends and we founded a school for social justice. It was a, a middle school initially and it grew into a larger space and more people came on and that was when i really realized that social justice means different things to different people so for some people social justice is really about the oppression of others so um for us one of the ways that we believe that we engage in social justice on our end is i mean uh really trying to present um archives in a way that is not necessarily linear and is not necessarily through one media and um you know we we want to engage as many senses as possible so that we get um give access and and get access from different people and that's been a really important factor in how we engage with archives That's so great. Um, I love that how you, so many of you have such creative ways of talking about how to integrate social justice mission. It's like what you collect, how you collect, what you make available, and how do you think about kind of accessing? So this next question is actually about access. Um, how do people access your collections? Is digital the main avenue to access your archive? How have you transformed your points of access since the start of the pandemic? Um, that's very much on our present mind right now. And also, are there any sort of advantages, advantages and disadvantages of um, using internet as a place um, to make available your archive? Yeah, we're, at LACA, we're extremely reliant on our online database. Um, it's another tool we have to visualize connections happening in, in our creative communities. Um, and I can give an example. I mean, so when you type in an artist's name, you quickly see something like the artist donated ephemera. Um, let's say there's a recording that they've done with K-Chung Radio, then at a time that they were involved in someone else's publication, and then their studio lease in the from the lease collection. Um, so it may not seem particularly grand, um, but it can lead to, I think by seeing, by being able to see these connections, it can lead to productive conversations on how art gets made and what the state of art making is right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've really had to reassess what makes a neighborhood library that you can just pop into during the pandemic. Um, it has been a conflict for me to be both a welcoming space an inviting um, place, but also to ensure the folks who volunteer here and work here safety. So, I mean, on a logistical level, we've created outdoor workstations for researchers um, who want to access the physical materials. Um, and while every item on the stack has an entry into the database, we're doing like a massive scanning and which I'm sure all of us are, are doing, but I'm, we're also taking one thing that's important to me, which some of the slides showed is that we're taking oral history accounts of more of our collections. 
Uh, John, is there anything you would like to say about access? Thanks, yeah. I mean, we are, you know, we are, um, we're about being a place where people are. So it's very, you know, it's about, it's about a community resource for people to be there, whether it's for, you know, a conversation, a rehearsal, an exhibition, an, uh, an event initiated by anybody in the community, or, um, you know, or the film nights we do, or all kinds of stuff like that, as well as the archiving. So, so it's, it's and our archivist actually Henry Apodaca, one of our, our media archivists, is is like adamant about you know we want people to come in here, we want people to inter interact with the other people in the community. So we have of course done all these different things. Like I said, the the actually the, the archive that I showed earlier, the Walk the Talk archive, that all that software that had been designed and the whole thing, it was it had been available but not online up until up until the pandemic so we've done that and other things to make things more accessible but you know we it's really about people being in the space and i and i didn't i didn't speak to the last question because i couldn't remember what the question was after a long time but uh but i, I briefly i'll say something so so about about five years ago we did an exhibition with Rostin Wu called uh, the back nine because we heard that the city was going to redo the planning of uh, downtown. We were worried what would happen to Skid Row. We, we made a miniature golf course that was playable and themed around zoning out of that. And the whole department of city planning, as well as everyone from the neighborhood came and played it. And, um, and out of that, a coalition called Skid Row Now in 2040 came to maintain a dialogue with the department of city planning. The exhibition we had there now uh, when when things closed down, it's still there actually, um, is how to house 7,000 people in Skid Row, which was what Skid Row Now 2040, the community uh, alliance that, uh, came up with as, as things they wanted to see in the future. So we've actually, and we've maintained our dialogue with the city and actually the latest iteration of their plan has incorporated a lot of the community uh, suggestions. So all these things the, the exhibition led to a dialogue with the city, led to uh, the organization of the community, led to uh, the city readjusting their plan, and it's ongoing. And I'll stop. Yeah, I, I can, um, we, we're increasing our digital um, use. We were starting to do that before the pandemic, but the pandemic has actually made it absolutely critical because pe before people would come into the archive and research in the space, we only a a less, maybe a third of the collection is cataloged and only 10% of the collection is digitized. And before the pandemic, we only had about 4,000 researchable online. Of the, so the 10,000 digitized images, only you know, less than half were online. So fortunately the the exhibition that was supposed to be actual physical exhibition that was supposed to go up downtown the the funders said you know making a digital exhibition is fine so we did that um but then what we use the other time that we had because people were coming in we didn't have volunteers we didn't have researchers we had staff had had time to do other things we put more posters online so now we we've, we've literally doubled the amount of posters that we have online we go from four thousand to eight thousand uh, for research, but that's, you know, that's leaves in, there's still 82,000 left to, to deal with, but they're not digitized. So I'm really grateful for the, the, the ability to digitize and to get the stuff online, but there's a big but. The people who find our stuff online, are the, first of all, there's a digital divide. And as you see by all this online and learning, the, the, the middle class households have no problem getting a computer for every kid and having internet access. The, the, you know, the income challenge communities, if they're lucky to have one computer, which kid gets it when, and a lot of them, you know, don't, 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 can't afford internet. That's a whole utility. So they, they were going to the library. They can't go to the libraries anymore. So there's the digital divide that existed pre pandemic is even bigger now. So that's, that's a big, that's a big problem with, with, with digital. The other issue with digital is that like we have an exhibit every year. We've had a partnership with Mercado La Paloma. That's downtown, South LA. The, it's a majority Latinx community, mainly working class, but it's a very diverse audience. Plus a lot of tourists come because the food's so great. So people will come see our exhibits, our exhibitions that really had no idea that they were there. 
Some people came because to see the exhibition, but most people come because of the food or a meeting hall. And then they say, well, what's this all about? You don't have that, kind of, like, that chance meeting, that chance seeing a poster or an exhibition when you're on, on, on the internet because you're, you, you're looking for something specific. So the, the, you're, 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 again, it's like speaking to people who want to know what you're talking about but it's not, it's not this chance, chance occurrence that's way, way, way limited with, with the internet. You know, I appreciate a lot of what Carol just said about the digital divide. Our center does not have the capacity to digitize anything. So we are having to partner right now with institutions. We, like I said, we are not currently a repository. We have an anti-space that um, we're hoping to be able to raise money for so that we can open that space and that will be a repository. However, and that's at the old Washington Irving Library that's been um, deeded over to us. Um, however, um, we really grapple with this because a lot of our community members don't want things digitized. There is a um, sexiness to a lot of the items that we present that is uh, unfortunate sometimes and becomes very exploitative. And we don't want to participate in the um, ongoing of that exploitation. So we're really thinking about the ways that, that we present. We have some digitization that we've done whenever we've been able to, you know, take my laptop in or someone else uh, on the staff. The Department of Cultural Affairs gives us absolutely no equipment whatsoever. So with that said, we kind of have to bring in our own and try and do what we can with whatever archives come in, in the, from the community and the exhibitions that we have. We, um, someone actually asked the, uh, a, a question about uh, digital platforms. Thanks to UMI, we were introduced to Airtable and we we're able to kind of like do whatever we can. We find ways to do whatever we can for free, you know, because like I said, we don't get funding. We, and we have trouble getting funding because we're a city facility. We're not funded by cultural affairs very well. And so all other forms of funding, we can't really receive because of the fact that we're a city facility. It's a, it's a strange dynamic. So it's really a lot of interacting and working uh, hand in hand with community members so that we can do the work that we have to do to continue uh, keeping these histories alive. And, and the other aspect of it is to, um, first of all, I mean, when it comes to tactile pieces, digital is once again, not the be all and end all. Those platforms change. I mean, how many of y'all used to use the floppy disks? You know, I just had to go and have a bunch of floppy disks converted to to um, have our, our archive from from the past. So um, so actually trying to find alternative means of, of uh, maintaining these archives are really important to us as well. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, so I think we have how much time? Ten minutes left. Jamie, um, and uh, we do have one prepare. Sorry, Jamie. Oh, did you uh, sorry. Uh, we could do um, if everyone is. Hopefully, we'll stick around a little bit longer. Um, we can just because there are some really great questions. Some folks have been putting in the chat. Um, we can uh, spend about another like closer to twenty minutes, including for just a few minutes for the Q and A. Okay, that sounds good. All right, I've got my marching order. So um, this next question and uh, is actually about long-term preservation. And um, I, just, you know, I just want to make sure that there's also time for Q&A with the audience. Um, so if the panelists would like to answer this question um, about the ethical considerations that you make when you, you're making a preservation plan, um, particularly with regards to technology and infrastructure, um, what questions do you ask when you make these decisions? And, um, you know, I think some of you began to touch on it. And I'd love to just hear a bit more about how you think about technology and pre preservation. Yeah, I like this question because so many archives are deemed archives because um, they have a long term preservation strategy, which is fair. Um, but this does not always makes sense for particularly community archives. 
Um, for LACA, it was really informative for us to develop our preservation policy. Because while we have a system where our materials are stored and, um, and valued equally, uh, suddenly we had to ask, like, if there is a fire, what would be the thing you run out with? What would be the thing that you save? Um, first tier, second tier, last tier. And I mean, that's what I like about archival work is that there's the theory and then there's praxis where you have to kind of resolve these, these ideas. So I think Zach um, Whitworth wrote in the question um, about if we ever had to close our doors. Um, and we think about this as an exercise. Um, so we would go as an entire group. There would be no deaccessioning allowed. Um, we would go somewhere that's like-minded and autonomous. Uh, and this archive would also have to allow artists to play their key role in shaping their materials. Um, we don't imagine ever doing this, but it's, I think, an exercise that we have to constantly be, be asking. Um, and I wrote down a note that was something I really enjoyed. Um, a colleague said, um, so the economy of LACA is a losing one. We house decaying objects, ideas, bodies. But what I hope is that we also preserve the vitality of lives as they're living in the present. So I thought that that was really nice. And I know that this is, I mean, it's meaningful work for me, but I know it's really meaningful work for, for all of us. On our end, like like I said, I mean, one of the things I appreciate about um, everyone who's who's present here today is that um, they are an alternative to major institutions, and major institutions are are currently hiring amazing curators who become very endear endear themselves to um, people who have um, archives in in our community in, in particular in South Central and East LA, and um, and then when they go into these institutions, they're prisons. The institution, their libraries are prisons for these archives. The communities in which they come out of no longer have access to them. And so it, I think it's really important for archives to live and breathe in, in smaller settings, in communities like you have here. And um, currently, like I said, the archives that we work with are housed with the people that have collected them. So um, that's, that's where they stay. We're working with them on ways to try and preserve it and keep it themselves so that they can exhibit it and they can, they can uh, present it to the community and they can um, give access for study, not just to a PhD candidate, but to um, someone around the corner who, who decides that they just wanna learn uh, about whatever it is that's been collected. So. I think, um, I think in terms of ethics, one of the things that we really think about is, is how an archive is presented, the context, and then how it will live on as well. Carol, you're muted. Sorry. Um, I, I just wanna, you know, support what Ami just said, because I, you know, the library, because we're always dealing with this, what happens when, you know, we can't deal with it or need to find someplace else or merge with an organization. And, you know, the, the independence is really critical, not only for the fact that people can't get into these institutions, um, but also because the issue of censorship. The only time we've had exhibitions censored are at universities, you know? And so we, we have freedom to do anything, anything we want to do, um, as far as topics go, we've done some pretty out there topics, but we, no board of directors of universities is going to let us go, do what we want to do. In fact, we had an exhibit at USC many, in 1992, the 500th anniversary of, um, you know, Columbus, um, and the title was 500 Years Since Columbus, The Legacy Continues. So the legacy was exploitation and genocide and colonialism, et cetera. 
And it went up, uh, the, one of the Chicano organizations on campus sponsored it. And one of, as soon as one of the board of directors who was Italian saw it, said, took a personal offense that it was anti-Columbus and ordered it down. And then not only that, he, ordered, he put a whole series of restrictions against student groups doing exhibitions in public spaces after that. So all you, all you need is one controversial, same thing happened with Loyola Law School. Students had one of our exhibits, somebody complained. No, they, they were a law school, free speech. They couldn't order it down because that would have been, but they put disclaimers up and then they put all kinds of restrictions, um, including they kept getting more and more strict until they, they needed a faculty approval. So, so that stuff happens in institutions. Um, many of you may know Bar the artist Barbara Carrasco. She's a, a really good friend and she had one of her, her, her portrait of Dolores Huerta and other artwork that she did was in the Library of Congress. And she was in Washington DC and she wanted to show someone her work. She didn't have a letter from her publisher that she was working on a book. That she was not allowed to show her own work, to see her own work. She had to call someone, she knew someone in, in the government who called the Library of Congress and say, let her see her work. But most people don't have those contacts. So it's, 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 it, it, they take care of them, they preserve them, but they, they're, the access is very, very, very limited. Yeah, um, I'd say I'd say um, that. Uh, well, first of all, I, I agree with what uh, Ami and uh, and uh, Carol were saying about about independence. You know, um, just generally speaking, being an independent uh, organization. That, I mean, beyond the archive, everything we um, we found that being independent allows us to be independent. You know, and avoids a lot of the uh, a lot of uh, yeah, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of the things we've done if we were not independent, if we were part of some larger organization. And I want to thank Haley for bringing up such things, things that we I'll bring back to our archivists to think about, like what to carry out during a fire. We never thought about that. We thought, um, you know, I mean, everything is, as far as I know, everything or nothing is what I would say. And, um, and, I, also, and I also agree with what you said about not splitting up the collection. And, uh, and uh, again, what Ami said, like once something goes into an, uh, a university archive, and what Carol said, you, you can't get access to it. Because we were actually, um, someone, someone who, who I respect very much, who, who's an independent publisher, who's also working with archives. And just as we were, really, just as we were starting this, he was, or even before, he was talking about maybe, you know, moving our archives to, a, to a, just the LAPD archives to a university. And uh, our board said, what? We'll never be able to get access to anything for an exhibition for anything. And so that was the end of that. So anyway, thank you for all your things that jiggled my brain. You know, in, in talking about the, um, the fire, thank you for, for reminding me of that. And thank you, Haley, for mentioning it initially. I come from people whose entire histories were burned uh, during the Crusades. And so there was no opportunity to really carry anything out. And oral histories and finding alternative ways of archiving are really important. I saw a performance, I want to say, um, and, and I mean, I've seen many performances that were super important, of course, but there was a performance by Ron Athey years ago where um, he stood on a, a glass plate and um, across from him was, um, uh, I want to say it was Julie Tolentino uh, across from him. And every time he performed an act of bloodletting, um, she did as well while they kind of smeared their blood, which was their personal DNA and archive on this glass plate. And it, it, was, it was so reverberating for me because it really talked about this, the, the minute details of archives and the many, many different ways ways that an archive can be uh, uh, preserved and histories can be preserved as well. I love, I love just how like all my questions, you know, kind of take us to a whole different realm in kind of talking about the counter values of, you know, what archives are supposed to be long lasting or huge institutionalized. You're saying that actually important to keep it small human scale and like stay true to the mission of the community um 
one question that came up in the chat box, I just want to make sure that we have a little bit of time to address it if, if you're up for it. Is that there's a question about the end of archives, like the end of things. Um, at what point could archives no longer be sustained? And I'm, I'm assuming this is a physical archive that we're referencing. And like I said, I, I think that as, as, as I think that archives continue. I think that we have to be, be much broader in the ways that we think about an archive. If you're talking about paper documents, if you're talking about um, objects, um, certainly there could be an end. Um, but if we're not, if we're talking about uh, transmitting ideas, if we're talking about expressing those ideas um, through touch, through word, um, through sound, uh, then it becomes something entirely different. But it's also, mm -hmm. I mean, go ahead, go somebody, ahead. Was I interrupt somebody? Okay. Um, you know, in this in this period of time where climate change is overriding, you know, the entire world as we know it. I mean, that's, you know, there's a there's a real question of mass extinction, which has already started. And, you know, so, I mean, I could, so, but if there's no people, I mean, people who have archives is basically optimist because they, they assume there's gonna be a future. And there's, there's a future for people to wanna learn about other times and other places and other cultures and, 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 and other issues. So I, I think we're, 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 we're in a moment, which I find a very, exist, not, not just me, but a very existential moment, um, and you know what what happens with 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 the, with civilization, um, with with humanity, with with life in general and in specific. So I think that's you know if think of how many all all those papers. Think of the library in Alexandria that was burnt to the ground. That there's nothing left. So we only have certain you know the objects that remain are the objects primarily by the rich and powerful that were done the stone buildings the superstructures the stuff the wooden the wooden structures the straw structures that the average person whatever that means lived in they don't exist but the pyramids exist the cathedrals exist so you'll have you'll have certain things that will survive for the for the folks that come from out of space in five million years so say what was this what was this civilization or lack of civilization all about but that's I mean that's it's really an existential question of our is, is there is there going to be a future for people to to be around to do this kind of research I mean I'm still optimistic but we don't have a lot of time to make that to make the right moves so, so Carol I think is both optimistic and apocalyptic and uh, that sort of covers the waterfront there. Um, I think, you know, in a way, archives are no different than any other, you know, artistic activity or small or community organization. They all, you know, they all sort of exist precariously from moment to moment. And only by, you know, clever adaptations, they, they go on for, you know, in the case of Carol's 31 years or whatever, you know. And so, so, the, as long as they're valued by somebody, somebody will find, people will find a way to make clever adaptations and keep things going. And I think that's the, that's my share of the optimism of this. Hey, Louis, did you have anything to add to this? You're muted. No. Nope. Okay. Well, I think we're pretty much at time. If nobody wants to add any final remark, med checking, like speakers wise, any final remark? Oh, oh Carol, you're, you're also muted, muted. <laughs> Carol. Because <laughs> oh, I take my hand away whenever I, I, I <laughs> mute when I take my hand away. I talk with my hands. So, what, what John just said is interesting about you know being optimistic and apocalyptic at the same time. I think so many things that as maintaining an archive are contradictory. I mean, here we're trying to say things that were tended to be ephemera. There's a contradiction. Um, we're both trying to protect the objects and get them seen by as many people as possible there's a contradiction so so many of the things that we are doing have 
are, are, are polar, have polarized aspect to them, are contradictory to them, um, that I think that's, 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 that's part of being an archivist is being able to maintain two things that don't, you know, cannot exist on the, at the same time and you try to do both. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for offering that final remark. Um, I think there's no better ending to talking about the end of things, right? Um, I'd like to thank all of our awesome panelists today. And also, I'd like to thank Jamie and Daniela from uh, LA Municipal Art Gallery. Um, it's been a lovely conversation. Jamie, did you want to um, say anything else? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, just again, on behalf of the gallery, just massive thank you to our program speakers, Ami, John, Carol, and Haley for sharing your insights and just really, truly the really inspiring and groundbreaking, groundbreaking work that you're doing. Um, it's really important work and I really hope that um, everyone here who is a part of the conversation um, really checks them out if you haven't been familiar with them and the work that they do and we'll make sure to send links to everyone too just so you have that um and then just thank you umi for moderating today's program and just for your really thoughtful um questions it was a really fantastic conversation and i'm so happy that we have the capability of recording things so we have this we have this we can have this available and um thank you to everyone who joined us for today and for your questions and uh just one final plug if you have not seen archive machines i highly encourage you to check it out at lamag's website and um, we'll make sure to share that with everyone too along with the other goodies and thank you again everyone have a great rest of your weekend and stay safe and we'll see you again soon <laughs>